Thank you everyone again for coming to our annual winter show. We also want to thank our fearless leader behind me here, uh, Tom Matano, who we all affectionately call Papa here at School of Industrial Design. Um, he's really set the culture in the department uh, for us to grow and thrive uh, as designers and to find our world, find our, our, find our place in the world on how we're going to be able to improve it through hard work, through dedication of, to our craft, and that's one of the things, you know, we get a lot of people that come up and they'll say, you know, you guys did a great job, you guys put on a great show, but really the stars of the show are always the students. And with that, I really want to take this minute to thank the students for all the hard work. Um, you guys will sleep well tonight. <laughs> So with that said, I'm going to pass it on to Tom. He's going to tell you guys a little love story about a little, little roaster that could. So we're excited to, uh, again, have him as our fearless leader. And, uh, and we cherish each moment that we get to spend uh, with his great design mind. So uh, with that said, um, he's going to take you guys on a little journey of the 30-year anniversary of a little roaster called the Miata. Uh. Thank you, Antonio, and thank you all for uh, showing up tonight. Um, you know, funny thing about this is already 30 years in the market, but I started 35 years ago. And sickening part of all this is nobody here were born at the time. <laughs> I never thought that would happen. <laughs> Anyways, um, because of this one car, that I couldn't go to work for another car company after I finished Mazda. And I had to come to some neutral zone, which is a school, um, it would be the destination. So I'm lucky to be here. And uh, I got so many former graduates doing a great job. All I ask for you guys in the class is to make me look good when you finish the school here. <laughs> okay? And are you guys doing that? So thank you. Okay, let's go. So this whole journey thing is that project is really started in 84, but start way back in the 70, um, when I was kicked out of engineering school, um, they, I decided to go to design, and I never drawn anything, so I came to the States as a language stu school student. I couldn't speak English at a time, so. And then I came to the California and get off the plane and look at the sky and say, well, I have to have a convertible. So, so I bought the first convertible. That's how it started. And then um, I joined Mazda in 83, uh, December, and they're starting this project called Lightweight Sports, which became the Miata uh, five years after that. Um, but what I did was the, the, the Japanese people, the, our headquarter engineers, didn't really have any experience living with sports cars or enthusiast cars in a sense. So I wrote this story to explain what this car should do. Now, this is back in 84, okay? So you can kind of see through it. But um, today we call it storytelling. And what this is, actually, I did the storytelling back in uh, 35 years ago. So, you know, this is what you start noticing the cars. This is like a boy, boy meets girls or girls meets boy in a way. And then eventually you go to the dealership and take a look. And by then you have some sort of exp expectation of it. When you go to test drive, turn the motor, you feel like, you know, the sounds like you're expecting. Or, and then start driving the first turn that you turn the wheels and that sensation of how easily the car turned under your command. Uh, so forth and so forth, and at uh, the end of the day, we want them to be a customer. And our most product planning stops there. You know, they're just trying to sell their car, and their product planning is always, that's the end goal for somebody to pay money to get the car off the hand. Now, this story starting from here is a main thing. The life with a car is the most important. How many of you buy a car, used or new, whatever, go come home, take your friends or family to test drive and all, but at the end of the night, 
how many of you are going back to the garage and say goodnight to the car? <laughs> okay? Now, this may be more product design oriented, but if you go to the car oriented people, most of them raise hand. So that's what, you know, we want the car to do. Our design has to do people to say goodnight to the car at the end of the night. Um, or how many of you go park your car, walk away from your car, go into the school or office, wherever. Have you turned back and look at your car one more time before you go into the building? <laughs> okay, those are the car enthusiasts. Or the car that has that character that people would adore. I don't think a lot of people, I, well, like Tesla truck may not gonna say goodnight to. <laughs> oh. Or, 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 or the Prius or something, but <laughs> that's beside the point. And then eventually, you know, you have to find the road that be more challenging or more fun, even though it takes 20 minutes more, but that's more of a joy. Uh, that, you know, debriefing of the day after work or something, the car should do that for you. So, and I said, how many of you find a little tunnel that you can go through to hear the noise of your, you know, sound of your car, right? And how many of you love to drive next to the showroom with a nice mirrored window so you can reflect upon yourself? Those are the kind of thing that car will make you do that. And that's the kind of car we wanted to design. And then, you know, you drive it, but it's, this Miata was a two-seater, so eventually you get married or different situation, you have to sell it. But one day you want to come back to it and you wanted to restore it. So what I did was, 35 years ago, I went to the engineer and said, is there any way we can keep the fenders and panels in a sardine can, you know, like in oil? And 30 years later, I want to release it as a restoration kit. Um, luckily, this year, Mazda announced that they're going to do a restoration program and they start rebuilding some of the parts. So that whole thing became our design philosophy, and that's 30-some years ago, five years ago. Finally, Mazda as a company embraced this whole thing today. The cars, the driver-oriented cars, and all this stuff is today. Uh, all the Mazda cars have it, finally, and our marketing, everybody, is unified to do so. And then that, that was a love story, but also I did all this other stuff. Like one thing I did was, um, as if the car became a legend 30 years later, somebody would write the book about collector's guide to the Miata. Now, this time, we didn't have any sketch, written, you know, sketch drawn at the time. But I said, oh, as if this car became something, people write the book about it. So I say, year one, year two, year three, year four, year five, the rumors of a second generation come around and so forth. Um, and then the second gen and so forth. So one time, a Mazda did the uh, British Racing Green, uh, the limited edition, second year. They built 1,500. They sold out right away. So they want to do it again the next year. Our marketing get greedy. They want to do it again. So I said, look, 30 years from now, somebody read the book. Mazda what, successfully sold 1,500 units, limited edition. Following year, Mazda marketing get greedy and they did another 1,500. Can you live with this story? So I got stopped that doing the second, gener you know, second limited edition, the same model, the following year. And another one was all this detail about how the, the feel of the steering wheel to the gear shift or the gauges you know, coincide with the power buildup and so forth and so forth. One is the exhaust note, another one, you know, the fan noise and all that. The lucky part of it is the chief engineer never driven the sports car, never knew anything about it, so he said, I'm gonna build it exactly what you guys wanted. And sure enough, he did exactly what we asked for, even more than what we asked for. For like a tailpipe sound, I wanted to have him to come over to like historic car race in Laguna Seca, have them listen to it. He never showed up, but he recorded different sound, tested it with the public, narrowed it down to two or three sounds. He analyzed every sound range and commonality of this top three and recreated the sounds matching those three wavelengths or whatever that he found. 
and that's the final sound of the car, for example. Today you can tune it with us like a Jaguar. You can record the sound from there and amplify it and stuff. But this is, this is 35 years ago in analog too. And so the story that I wrote, most of the thing came true, pretty much like a club. I wanted to have a good club, strong club around the world. I wanted to have many publication about this car. That's a yardstick that we can measure the success of this car. And this is early development, the first clay model. So we got a couple of modelers from Japan. We developed this tiny little studio and did the whole clay model. And this is the first fiberglass model we presented to Japan in uh, June of 84. And they had a, two other models from other studios in Japan. And of, obviously, this is the one, the final direction being picked. And that's like more of a detail design uh, sketches. And then, any marketing in the Mazda organization don't want to sell this car, didn't want to sell it. No way we can sell this car. So the one of the managing directors said, well, no or go or no go, we have to test it. So we got the real uh, actual driving prototype and he wanted to test it on the street. <laughs> you know, everybody hides those cars today, but we put it on the Santa Barbara shopping mall, and all of a sudden, like, 50 people showed up, and somebody had a camera, and we had to chase this guy with a camera. I said, please don't, don't do it, anything with it. And, <laughs> <laughs> and then we had to go to the back road of a Santa Barbara, and then a lot of people chasing us, and the guy with the Mercedes dropped the key, said, hey, Give me your key, we'll swap. <laughs> but because of that, the guy with the white shirts over there, he's one of the directors, um, he became a true believer in this project. So whenever we hit the, the hard spot, that he supported us with a chairman. So, And again, I want this to be special. You know, a lot of people, the special people, have interesting stories about it. So if we started with interesting stories, car may become something special. So I did the reverse engineering of that. So first of all, that, that thing is our R&D center. Year before the car was introduced, I put the fiberglass casting of the front and rear on the front lobby wall. Nobody do that, but I wanted to do it. And then I said, what is that? Oh, that's a, a you know, failure. I mean, the headquarter didn't like it. <laughs> it's a reject. I said, I want to put it on the wall for a whole year. And a car came out, and everybody said, you had it up there. I said, yeah, 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 you didn't think of it. <laughs> and this is the first, first prototype came over. And that little gap on the headlamp still exists on the production car, unfortunately. Halfway point, we switched the material from uh, steel hood to aluminum, and a curvature, stamping curvature difference from the headlight cover to the hood. So most of the Miata has that gap. And then every time I go to the club event, I had to put my finger under the headlamp cover to fixing it. <laughs> it's my responsibility. And th this is the first catalog that came out. And of course, that's the final design. Now, because of this one car, I, I said, first one I was surprised was the wedding came from Japan, right on the, the, the year that we announced the car. And I didn't think the Japanese people have that kind of idea, but they did. So I was really happy with that. And the uh, Ross Labgrob, you know the, the, you know the industrial designer guys know Ross, the you know, organic chairs and stuff. He wrote this story about this tail lamp. So we borrowed his story, made it up to uh, Mo New York MoMA, um, permanent collection, that tail lamp became a collection. And these are the national events of the Miata Club, the Ohio. You know, that guy next to me was a 72 when I met him, and then he had a station wagon and sold the station wagon, and he bought the Miata. And already three times he went, drove down from Wisconsin to Colorado to see his daughter. And that's such an inspiration, I admire that you know, the, the, the happiness of him and everything. Now I am the 72, so I guess <laughs> I have to start worrying about that. And that thing is one of the show cars for the 50 year anniversary, Speedster. 
And then this couple showed up with a Batman outfit. So it's a perfectly fit to that car, so I sat them in the car. And this is the Indy, the 251 uh, single car in a one place. Is a, at the time, was a Guinness Book of Record. Um, and about 6 in the morning on Sunday, we had to line up and get onto the track. And a guy next to me is a priest. On Sunday morning, he was with me on the track. So I said, wait a minute. Aren't you supposed to be somewhere else? <laughs> He goes, oh, yeah, but I can't lie. You know, this is more fun than doing the other stuff. <laughs> so he was an honest man. And this is Atlanta. And this is our fifth year uh, anniversary at our R&D. And then I wanted, to, you know, all this famous, like, uh, historical cars have Speedster, the lightweight, the coupe, in different body by Bertone, Pininfarina, all the custom coach builders. So I really wanted to have those things under Miata name. And Speedster, I know we're not going to be able to build it because structurally we have to cut the windshield down. Uh, our engineer wouldn't let me do it. So I did it as a Ferrari tribute to Ferrari one year. The, the historic was a Ferrari year. So I call it under the tribute to Ferrari created this sports car. I mean, prototype, knowingly, I'm going to make a speech draft to this. And I put my vice president in there, take a picture of it, make sure that he cannot refuse the next time we propose a, <laughs> you know, a little politics. So that orange one became that from the, the Ferrari to our speedster. And then Club Racer is the one that you drive during the week, go to the racetrack on Sunday. So that was a concept car we produced for the introduction in Chicago back in 89. This is a monopost, single seater, and a coupe, and of course, zero emission vehicle, the pedal car. And before electric cars, we presented in Chicago as a zero emission car. I just wanted to have a pedal car. And then <laughs> this one, one of the guys, uh, uh, son of the VP of G GM Design, uh, Mark Jordan, so his father retiring, and his father one hired me to GM. So I thought I'd just do this tribute for his retirement card with a son did the front of the Miata, and he did the back, the Cadillac. But somehow, somebody made a fiberglass body of it, you know, a red one and even silver one. And then somebody said, well, you know, I want to have a four-seater Miata. Well, somebody built it. Somebody got a Mustang as well. But the, my favorite is this pedal car race in Japan every year. The, the kids get in and they race, pedal car race. And see, that's cultivating the future Miata owners. And this is a starting of a second generation. And then again, the different, you know, different events around the world. I'm lucky to be around. That's a tenth. Of course, I had to have a good pasta and Swiss, and you know, Isle of Man and all this. But the best one is this one. When I saw that first time I saw that movie, Mia and Tia, I said, gotta be Miata, you know. And, and sure enough, they had this like a collector models. And um, then I realized that finally that, that my dream of this become a household name, um, you know, one of the proof of it. And then the 25th, the fourth generation Miata announcement. They didn't show me until night before. This is a global release. And the boys that didn't show me said, I know, I, don't worry, we did it exactly what you wanted. So I said, well, yeah, but you guys also know I can't do a poker face. <laughs> so, tomorrow you open the lid for world release and I make a face behind this car. You're going to be in trouble. So they said, OK. <laughs> anyway, and then this year, as, uh, from February, we went back to Chicago the 30 years ago we introduced. So we had this uh, Chicago. But the best part of all this this year, I've been to many places, thanks to uh, Antonio covering my classes <laughs> and stuff. But uh, I got to see a lot of places. But every place you go, the car earned the citizenship. This is 
UK, 2,200 cars. This is Czech Republic. I didn't realize they had 300 cars that we never exported to that country until recently. Uh, so they are gray market cars imported from other countries, and they already have an event like that. And again, the Belgium wedding, and then this is the Italian event. And this is the Philippines. They made these special shirts when they heard the new one going to be orange, the limited edition. But a real car is a little bit different <laughs> shade of orange. <laughs> but, but too late. And this is the UK. This is, again, 2,400 cars. It, the interesting part is they really do a, such a great job on, like, line up model years or the colors and all this organization. And amazing part of it is any single owner of a red or blue or whatever, they go back to their own cars without losing where they were. It's just amazing. You know, if this was a factory, all look alike, exactly the same, right, when they leave the factory. But when they got ownership, somehow they, I don't know, smell them or whatever, they can go back to their own car. And this is on, the, on the, uh, your left is a 30th anniversary in Japan. That Philippine group, you can see the orange on there. They sent 98 people from Philippines for that event. Way out of proportion to the size of the market. And this is our event in the USA. And I got to meet my, my f creation, the coop. I did this coop as my retirement present to myself. I, I, I kept it extra set for this. But a quick show car project came out. I had to release that sp spare parts and made it, so I'm not going to have that. But that was my idea of having a retirement coupe. Okay, so now, how in the hell I got this, <laughs> this part is my grandpa had this car, Morris, British Morris Minor, and they had a red leather seats. So every car that I own has to have a leather seats because of this memory of that my grandpa. And my uncle had one of those little trucks and sit side by side with him, and I'd be in the navigator turning the certain turn indicator. So I kind of like the coziness of a little car. And then the other one is my great uncle had that 57 Cadillac, and the neighbor had this Citroen 2CV. It's a basic car, the top of the line luxury. So I could have a good range of, you know, top to bottom. Everything I do always has to be in some sort of range, design-wise or whatever I did, always had a range. Like that Cadillac or the air conditioner coming through the rear shelf, go to the side and come out. And that's in 1957 model. And I was so impressed. You know, 57 in Japan, there are no air conditioner in office or even a house. But this car had an air conditioner, and I was like, what, 10 years old? And my ice cream didn't melt it in that car, so I was so impressed. <laughs> so one day, I have to come to the States, you know, because of this. And, and of course, any kids love cars do a doodles. These are my doodles. And then this is my first car. And I used to practice how to do a corner, and that's a hairpin turn next to the prince's residence, because there are usually no cars around it, so it's a really good place to do it. And then one day I was waxing at the gas station. Guy said, can I take a picture of your car? I said, sure. And about two months later, he, he sent me this magazine with these shots in there. It says, how to wax the car. Now, I understand today most of you never wax on your own car today, right? I heard, and polishing and stuff. I used to do this so the wax dry and matte finish, then you wipe it off the certain area, you can see the highlight of the car. And I wasn't a designer at the time, but things that we do today uh, as a professional, this is another one like, you know, this is an instruction drawing to my body shop guy to do this fog lamp and other stuff. And I was an engineering student. Now, now you know I got kicked out of that school. Uh, this is another one. This time I did the paint. I mixed the paint and did the swatches and then finally painted two, three different doors in this color. Finally adjusted and this is the final model. 
Um, I originally, I wanted to be an architecture student, and, and so I did those uh, sketches. Last year, my friend showed up to my office, saw this little sketch on the wall. He gave me this 3D model from that sketch. So this is another one I did back in, like, I was 18. I wanted to be an architectural design person, and he created the um, 3D model. And also, like a furniture design, these are modular wall unit. See, you've got a car seat in there, see, the bucket seat. The, the, that's a bucket seat with a speaker. See, Miata have a headrest speaker, and the tape recorder is a kick, you know, show the ages there. You don't know the tape recorder, do you? And I love that fan, you know, think like automotive, the, the air, hot air comes from the top going down, circulating it, or the other way around. So that was one of the unit built into the wall unit. But then, uh, as I said, I've been kicked out of the engineer. <laughs> I had to find something, so came to LA, and I went to that other school in Los Angeles. Uh, now it's Pasadena, and I did this. Uh, so that, that, that was when I had a hair. Um, <laughs> and that sketch wasn't really a project in the semester, but I heard that Mr. Jordan is coming. So I study all his work and created that one rendering that might be in his, you know, in his taste or his liking. And sure enough, I got the job. And in the meantime, I did more of a modular engine, you know, the, that little modular power pack could stay in every part of the car and make those modular models. If it's electric, it's so much easier today, but this is like 70, I did it 74, published in 76, but you know, today I think these are make more sense. And then because of that one sketch I got, and I got the job in Detroit, so I moved to Detroit. At a time that Mitchell, Bill Mitchell was into this retro design, I wanted to do a little bit more modern, but that's what we had to do. But the first production happened in that Oldsmobile 70 um, Cutlass Grill, and that's a production one. And then because of the energy crisis in the US that Ford and Chrysler laid off 80% of their design staff, and GM hasn't had done it, but they're imminent that they have to do it. So they said, you, you are the first one to go, you know, the first one, last one to hire in the last three years, and then foreign visa, you'll be the first to go. <laughs> so I said, you're interested in another part of the, the GM organization? I said, okay, I thought it was Germany, but they came back and said, how about a Melbourne, Australia? <laughs> I said, well, I never thought of it, but it would be fun. So I went to Australia, spent six years, seven years. And there is a very slow pace. I can do a lot of my own imagination. Now, those are like what the wind tunnel do, you know, the double deckers and the underflow, airflow underneath and all that. And also how to learn how to render the illustration of it. And then I decided, oh, then I wanted to go to Germany after a few years in Australia because I want to learn one design will last a long time, you know, the way they design. But um, my boss wouldn't let me release to Opel, Germany, so I had to quit GM. So these are portfolios sent to BMW. So now I moved to Munich, and I did the E36 first year. But actual car that I worked on was more E46 than E36, and then started getting involved with the 8 Series. But that one year into it, I got a call from California saying, uh, we are starting a studio in, Mazda are gonna start the studio, would you like interested in coming in? I said yes, without even hesitation at all. Because, you know, in Munich, it's, it's dark in the morning, like eight o'clock, still dark, come home about 5.30 in the dark. And I'm a solar cell person, you know, I can't, six hour sunshine is not enough. And 20 below zero under your feet, okay? So I said yes, and I moved to uh, Orange County. 
again, because of the first pr proposal of a minivan and the Miata was successful, that they decided to invest on a bigger R&D center, I get to design the building as well. So my dream come true that way. I thought I was hired to set the whole developmental system, not just a proposal, you know, like how the advanced design would work, because they never had advanced design. So I did this to showcase, like normally you have theme model, like a design theme, then put this into the production. I was doing RX-7 already, but I just made it this to be more exaggerated as a theme, and then actual production would come through with it. These are early sketches for the FDR third generation. That's the sketch and a fifth clay model. This is the actual car, the final proposal. This one is a fiberglass model, um, went to Japan and came back. And instead of us keeping it, I loaned out to Peterson Museum so they can take a good care of it. And sure enough, still today, this is in super good condition in Peterson Museum. And that's the final production model. And the only thing that my vision that I wrote together was a Miata build, that people love cars live happily ever after. after you know, you got a retired mechanics and high octane gases, and you know, you have to sign in, the car noise and smell of the fume wouldn't bother you, all right? And, and then in the morning, you go that, oh, the house is built, and the back side of the house is a racing track, actual circuit. Front is more like a service road, you know, like winding road. And you can sign in in the morning, like before you go to work, like I do a five laps, like a little jogging back in, drive around, go to work, and then turn on the you know, computer or that website or whatever, said, oh, Mark Garcia beat me this morning, you know, or Antonio beat me this morning. So you reserve the time in the afternoon, come home before you go home, do a few laps, trying to beat that time, right? That's the kind of village that I want to live in. So that's yet to be coming. Although come, came close, one guy called me up from somewhere and says, I, I, what, do you have a hundred thousand dollars? I said, what, what, what for? Or you can name the corner now. We are buying the property to build your village, right? I said, okay, that's great. Where is it? Wisconsin. <laughs> and that wasn't part of my dream. <laughs> no offense to Wisconsin. <laughs> so now that's what I do. <laughs> Okay, but anyway, um, some of you may heard of this. Um, my learning is this. You know the um, difference between like a Japanese knife and Western knife? American knife cuts on, you know, forceful, the body weight goes in. Butcher is a word, or meat, type of meat you guys use is harder, so you have to push your body weight and cut. Now you think of these fish meat, Pull. It's slicing it much finer detail, much you know, gentler cut, right? Just that, like a kitchen knife would be different, saw would be different. A um, lot of things based upon culture that things evolve into a certain way. So instead of which is better or right, you know, right or wrong, you have to sort of understanding why. For example, like Japan always sent me a tin scale drawing and in GM or BMW, I used to work on a full-scale drawing. They will say, door handle need to be bigger, and then full-size drawing, you will know, it's kind of tight or whatever. 10-scale drawing, the door handle is this small. You, you can't get the feel of it, but that's how they do. And I went to Japan, and the engineering table is about one and a half times larger than that. That's all they have for each engineer. So no way they can roll up a full size and look at it, right? So again, depends on the circumstances that thing. So when I built the studio, I made it the American scale. So wide enough, big enough to compare in a real way, that way we see the cars in the US. And this is the development of our RX-7. So instead of putting Corvettes and Porsches as a competitor or comparator, 
I put all those things that stood the test of time because I want RX-7 to be a timeless design. So the measurement, the yardstick you create is a different tool to the normal way. So I got all the collectors. You know, I showed the studio open house and invited all the car clubs in Irvine, Orange County area. So I know where the good cars are. I can borrow the car for a month or two, whatever. So we get to pick different cars and bring it in keep it next to our cars, and if our cars got the same substance at least, then that have a potential to be a timeless design. So that was a tool. Now that car will be 92, so 27 years old now. Um, so safe to say, at least stood the test of time for that long. Um, and this is the first presentation I made to Japan with a full-size rendering. They never really did the full-size, so I did it just to showcase that tool. And these guys will be inching forward the, towards the car to about two, three feet away from the car. And every time I had to bring him back, come back, and then we'll inch out forward. The, the thing is, this is how you commute to work, you know, walk through all this around the cars and stuff to go to work. Like US, some of the residential areas like this. So the body memory of the car to your body distances in Japan and maybe two, three feet away is more natural distance to feel the car close to the car. U.S. may be different, okay? Another thing I notice is in Japan, most of the cars park rear end into the garage. And I think Korea the same way, I heard. Um, U.S. is like that. So we were asked to come up with a Mazda identity. Um, so I thought we should make a rear end more interesting than the front end, because all the Japanese companies spend all the time in detailing on the front end. But a rear end is just a two rectangular tail lamp and a license plate. So we introduced in little more curvatures, and, and I call it a memorable rear end. And I got hit hard on some of the customers, but that's another story. <laughs> Um, but we got a Playboy car of the year um, with the RX-7. Um, anyway, so, you know, scientifically makes sense. You, you, you're driving the car most of the time. You're he following the rear end of the car more in the United States. Japan as a pedestrian more, so you see the front end more. I, you know, my, my friend, he was a chief modeler, and I just, he discovered this on his file, so he sent it to me. See, like... 2005, I sent this to him, and sketch was done in 89. He just scanned and sent it back to me just like six months ago. And I was determined that rear end is the most important. I believe in it. For this one, that's US proposal. This is a Japanese modification, then translated to their own likings. So they say, you guys eating this greasy food, the burgers and all that, and you get fat. So we're going to make it lighter and skinnier and tone down a little bit. So that's what they do. So I said, well, you guys are sushi all the time. You need to cook a little bit, put a little more flavor. So that's ended up in uh, somewhere more towards our way because this volume of this car is more U.S. than Japan. Okay. So the color is another one that... Uh, we ask for neutral beige or tan from Japan. We always get this yellow tan, okay? So I made a 10 scale of a tan from reddish tan to yellowish tan, survey in Japan and then survey in US. The, the neutral tan for Japan is closer to yellow, like a fourth from the yellow end of the scale. American neutral is fourth from the red end of the scale. So there are gap between the two. Even though we speak the same name, neutral tan, we never got the same color. So since then, neutral number four could be for Japanese market, number six could be for US market. Long time I've been doing this and I learned that really doesn't matter car design or any design, you know, you, you really need a study of a mankind and human nature and a history of nature, history of human nature, history of you know, culture, that where it started and all that. And then don't judge it from one another and open-minded and understand where it came from. You learn a lot and you may have a newer solution that you never thought of. Okay, so I'm gonna have a ride and enjoy. Thank you. <laughs>
So I had a fun time for 35 years, and I'm having a much greater time here with the school.